Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend May Lynn. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is an actual thing worth a Google. It is episode 447 of this podcast, and we are ready and raring to go. This is a big, big episode. It's the day of the show, y'all. And we have got a full freaking episode of the podcast today. Super excited. So we have a monologue, of course, which is probably, you know, it, it, not telling tales out of school or nothing. This is probably the most important monologue that we have ever done. Yes. Ever. So just it, uh, be prepared for that. So then uh, our history section, our, educa- our educationally uneducational history section, uh, historic approximations. That's a two-parter. A two-parter. We'll be, we'll be doing part one today and part two in our next episode. <laughs> Very excited about that. That's a big one. And uh, our movie this week, uh, which is right over here. Yes? Yes. yes. Here, Over here? Yes. Over here. Over here. Our movie this week is the obscure... 1982 horror film blood beat and i really like the movie because it's very relatable it is extremely relatable bunny don't you just hate it when your psychic mom uses her psychic mind powers to spy on you having sex with your girlfriend who is secretly the reincarnation of a vengeful samurai spirit and who makes murders happen with her orgasms. Don't you just hate that when that happens? I I hate that what ha- when that happens, but what I really hate more is when she asks me, what do I think of her painting? Yeah, here's another thing that I hate. I that don't I, mind, that I absolutely hate. I don't mind having uh poltergeists in my kitchen. I don't mind that. What I do mind is when you start throwing Pepsi and tab cans at me. Those are expensive. Yes. Those are expensive. Do they even make tab anymore? I don't, I don't know. know I don't make tab anymore. Oh. Man, okay. So well, it really, I, I, and there's probably no reason because Tab was owned by Coke. Yeah. So yeah, it's just Coke. So this movie, it, it, it it may exist in a strange, ethereal kind of plane. That's a good point. You know where it just morphed into another product. Yeah. Uh, this week. It's going to be a big episode. Very excited. So let's get things started. Buddy! Yes! I'm doing this from my <laughs> wife's bedroom because oh, we were going to have... what's going on there? Yes, we were going to have um, my daughter Amber's boyfriend's boyfriend Jonathan's cousin has a baby and the baby was going to come over and the baby was going to come over in the morning but then the baby couldn't come over in the morning. Was the baby driving? uh, Yeah, yeah. Baby driver. Uh, That's my baby. Fuck your baby. So uh, oh, what's the name of the guy who was the Punisher? He had that great line. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't see me again, I'm fucking dead. Yeah. And then he leaves the elevator. I love that. John, so John Bernthal or something. Yes, 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 yes. So he so the baby is arriving in like a half hour. And so that means that I can't be soup I can't be super loud and cussy out in the living room. So my wife said that I could do it in our bedroom. Uh let me just turn off the blur my background. It's a lot. It, it, there's a lot behind me. You got a pile of clothes here and some t- 
towels and yoga and a bunch of papers. So just for everyone's benefit, we're keeping the blur my background feature on. Okay, no, 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 no. It's a lot, but it's only a lot differently. It's always a lot. That's there a good point. My background a is a lot. When it's not a lot. Yeah. But to this make my just wife a lot feel better differently. Yeah. To make my wife feel better, let's just do a virtual avatar. There you go. I'm in space. Space podcast. Yes. In color. So, Bunny. Yes. This is without a doubt. Absolutely serious. Totally serial. No BS. This, this opening segment, Bunny, Bunford, Bunningham, Bunsf Timothy Bunsfield. <laughs> this opening that you are listening to right now with your ear holes is beyond a shadow of a doubt. The single most important podcast opening in the near decade long history of the podcast, there is a baby in here. There is a baby in here. I, I'm not going to show the baby yeah. on the podcast because I don't think that the baby has signed a waiver. Your arm has just magically <laughs> appeared. That's uh, yeah, there are body parts just appearing all around you <laughs> and flickering. It's just like, yeah, space. it's pretty crazy. Yeah. In space, no one can hear you podcast. Yes. Is this the baby's foot? Yes, I that's the baby's, baby's foot. <laughs> Come on, let's baby. face it. In America, nobody can hear us podcast. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. So, okay, this segment, this opening, it's the most important monologue in the near decade-long history of the Pope on Film podcast. This segment is important, dare I say, historic. Not not just uh, May Lynn, the trans unicorn podcaster, and uh, Bunnington the Mysterious. I say the name, my friends! This opener is important to mankind. To all of humanity. Yes, dear listeners, this is indeed a monumental opening. Today, we are going to be asking the big questions. Stripping away the veneer of falsehood that plagues our internet-dressed lives and getting directly to the heart of what makes us all truly human. Yes. So, sorry. Uh, I just got a bit choked up there. Sorry, Bunster. Okay. Are you ready, Bunny? I, I, can one truly be ready? Really? Okay, okay. but I, I need to know if you're ready, Bunny. I, I am as ready as I possibly can be. Okay. Like, really ready. Like, super ready. Like, super ready, ready, Freddy, ready. Yes. As ready as possible, yes. Okay. So a few weeks ago, I got really stoned. No! Like, so stoned. Like, super stoned. And so right before I went to sleep, I'm scrolling through Facebook. Okay? I'm scrolling through Facebook. I see an ad. I see it. It was there. I saw it. I saw an ad. Okay? I saw okay. an ad. And it said, and I swear this is true, set me up to a lie detector because I saw it and it was there and I read it. The Facebook ad read, and I quote, Explore the versatility of Tostitos. Hey. That is what the ad said. 
yes. explore. That, that was an amazing effect, especially with the like Thank planet you. behind you. Yeah. Thank you. Explore the versatility of Tostitos. Yes. So I go to sleep. I'm high. I just smoked a bit of a pre-roll. I've had a hell of a time sleeping since uh, the beginning of 2022. And the pre-roll helps me sleep. And I usually do edibles and not smoke. So I'm stoned all the way to next Thursday. And as I'm fading off to sleepy town, my mind is ruminating. It's marinating in the chunky juices of this phrase, Bunny. I am saying it over and over again like a mantra. Like I'm George Harrison, host Beatles, saying this mantra over and over again that I learned from the Surrey mystic. Explore the versatility of Tostitos. Yes. So, Bunny, uh, there's more to this story. There is more to this story. But the first question, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Tostitos. Yes. They're just fucking potato chips. They're just potato chips, Bunny. No, they're corn chips. They're go oh, 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 they're corn chips. Okay. They're they're just corn chips. Potato corn chips. is not involved. Yes. Leave they are toast, corn chips. Leave potatoes out of this. Yes. Potatoes have enough problems of their own. Leave them so, out. So they're just chips. They're just chips. Tostitos. However, let's take this ad at face value. Let's take it seriously. Let's give it some proper time, some proper respect. Let's really dive deep into this. Buddy, what is the versatility of Tostitos? Uh, poker chips leads to my, leaps to mind immediately. Hey, that's a good one. Poker you know, chips. if you okay. don't have a traditional set of poker chips, you can always use Tostitos. Okay, that's a good one. Uh, uh, you can also basically build a house of cards out of Tostitos. Okay, house of cards. Uh, there, there would be no particular advantage in that case, but you could do it. Uh. In Moon Knight, the the bad guy whose name I forget, instead of putting broken glass in his shoes, he could have put broken Tostitos. That's a good point. Uh, Would have been a lot movie, more comfortable. And that movie, should be Tostitos' new catchphrase. Yeah. Tostitos. More comfortable than walking on broken glass. In the movie American Beauty, instead of a woman laying on the bed while rose petals fall on her, it could be Tostitos chips. The reason why this pop popped into my head is that we have already so far in just 18 minutes that we've been on the air done two references to Kevin Spacey movies, and I thought I'd bump it up to a third. Yes. Well, the House of Cards isn't really a movie. Three Kevin Spacey productions. Yes. Yeah. Bugs Life. I just threw that one out there. I did I didn't have a joke for that one. I thought, uh, hey, if the Trekkie convention's in town and you don't have the money for the Spock years. Well, you've got some glue and a bag of Tostitos, you can make it happen. Yes. yes and you if can. you're hungry during the con and you don't want to have to pay like $35 for one hot dog, just eat your ear. There you go. I, now, I just saved you some bucks. This will not work with all specific toasty dye. But if you Just get the, the singular, if you get the uh, if you get a nicely shaped Tostito, one that is yeah. actually triangular, you know, if the tip bends over and you get like a curly cue, not going to work. 
But if you get a good Tostito, you know, your ideal Tostito, you could throw it like a shuriken. Nice. That is a good. That is a good idea. You can fight uh, off your enemies with a bag of Tostitos. Here's another idea. Here's another one that I had. If you're like in a school play and you have to be a devil, just you can glue a Tostito to your chin. Yes. You know? And I thought, there you go. Boom. Now you're a cheesy devil in like a in like a melodrama. Yes. Snidely whiplash. Yes. With an edible chin. Here's another one. This one's a little bit crazy. This one I actually came up with while I was high, but I was I was trying to explore the versatility of Tostitos, which is what they want us to do. And I thought, okay, what if you're a woman and you're you're trying you're I don't know, you're reading Cosmopolitan magazine, L magazine, you're reading one of those listicles. Yeah. 50 ways to please your man and you're like honey we should do it uh how do you want me to be shaved or do you want me to be all natural and then he says i want you to be all shaved and so you shave down there and then he goes wait no all natural well what are you gonna do now you can't just magically grow no. uh pubic hair but you know what you can do you get get, get just a little triangle uh -huh. of a corn chip you glue it down there so not only do you have like your own little uh what is it a gherkin merkin a merkin not only do you have a merkin but while he's down there a little snack yeah that's a pretty good idea so already wow okay uh Tostitos does, there is a versatility to Tostitos. Yes. Is what we have learned. So now, okay, Bunny, uh, the story is far from over, okay? So I go to sleep. So I get high. I see this ad to explore the versatility of Tostitos. I go to sleep, and I swear to you, Bunny, I had a Tostito dream. I'm in this big supermarket. It's like a never-ending supermarket. It's like a Walmart meets the back rooms, and it's just never-ending. And I'm looking for Tostitos. I got to find Tostitos. I got to buy a bag of Tostitos. All of my problems in my life will be solved if I can just buy a bag of Tostitos. So I'm going down the aisles of this giant, creepy, uh, other-dimensional Walmart. But here's the problem. Every single aisle has chips in them. Yes. So like, oh, look, there's the toilet paper and chips. There's the cosmetics and chips, toys, magazines, chips, every aisle. And the more I can't find the Tostitos, the more I need them, the more it's a desire. I start to feel like Tostitos are the answer to everything. They're the answer to my anxiety, my depression, my sleep problems, life, the universe, and everything, Bunny. It's Tostitos. The answer isn't 42, Bunny. The answer is Tostito. Yes. So I wake up. And I'm not exactly sure why, but I'm kind of hungry for some chips. Not sure why. Yeah. Kind of hungry for some chips. So I wake up, and the first thing I do is I pick up my uh, tablet. And I look for that dang Tostitos ad. Obviously. So I can have it as proof and use it on the podcast. Uh, well, of course I can't find it. It's just nowhere. It's not on Facebook. It's not on Google. It's not on Bing. It's not on DuckDuckGo. It's not on Ask Jeeves. It is nowhere. It's just poof, finito. It's gone. I don't know where it is. I cannot find it, period. I swear to you, though, I did not imagine a Tostitos ad while I was high. Who would ever do that? Yeah. Not even the CEO of Tostitos would 
imagine a Tostitos ad into existence. So I swear to you, I didn't make this up. I start, but I do start thinking after like a good 35, 40 minutes looking for this ad. Is it possible that I imagined it imagined a Tostitos ad? Who gets so fucking high that they conjure a Tostitos ad out of thin air? I don't even like Tostitos, Bunny. <laughs> but Bunathan. It's Bunny for short. The full name is Bunathan. Uh I did not find the Tostitos ad. But I did find a different ad. Okay. And this one says on Facebook, and I quote, Explore the versatility of California prunes. Okay. That makes, that makes even less sense than the Tostitos bunny. No. What the hell? I am so in the weeds. I we we did good with the Tostitos. We came up with uh, we we explored Tostitos very Explore well. Oh, the space gene. Prunes, I, I got nothing. California prunes. Yes. Not just prunes, period. Specifically prunes from California. Yeah. I, I like to think I, I can really think of only the one use where you take them from the closet and put them directly into the trash. Okay. I just have a great idea for an ad for the California prunes. Now imagine the California raisins, but they're prunes, but yeah. they're still the California raisins and they're there and they're doing the dancing and they go, don't you know that I heard it through the grape? Oh, oh I need to shit. California prunes. But they would have to but they would have to be dancing with walkers and canes. Yeah. And then right when they start singing, that's when you hear the <laughs> coming from their stomachs, and it's like, oh yeah. Yeah, I gotta take a dump. And then they leave, and then that's the entire commercial. California raisins. They're the next California California prunes are the next yes. California raisins. So to summarize, Tostitos might be the ultimate answer to life, the universe, and everything. And California prunes have many uses. No doubt this is the single most important opening segment in the history of the Pope on Film podcast. Do you think we could get a sponsorship? From... Either for California prunes or Tostitos. Yeah. The weird thing is I think that we, we deserve have, it at least. The weird thing is, is that we do have a sponsor this week, and uh, that brings us into our first ad. Today's episode of the Pope on Film podcast is brought to you by the good people at Coca Cola. Drink Coke. Ah, that no longer tastes like piss. I did not want to say that. The copy that they sent us. Yes. told us to say that. It's very strange. They send us... We've been getting these uh, these uh, sponsors of these big soda companies. And uh, it's kind of weird, the ads. Here's another one that they have. Hey, did you know that if you pour soda on a corroded car battery that it will actually eat away all the corrosion? Now, what if you put it in your fucking mouth? Drink Coke. <laughs> that is that is shocking. I I do not want to use this foul language to be clear. Yeah. Don't want to be saying these horrible things. <laughs> they sent you one, bunny. What does yours say? What does mine say? Yeah. Uh mine says Coke, it raises the dead. Wow. I don't know why. These are some strange ads. Why can't we just do ads for Raid Shadow Legends like regular things on the interwebs? I don't know. But hey, uh, here's another one. Uh, Coke, it is more convenient than drinking out of the toilet. Yeah, here's another one. Drink Coke. What are you going to do? Not drink it, you bitch? I don't know why they would have us say this. <laughs> I'm shocked. 
You know how much they paid us to? It's in the six figures. It is shocking. We tried to tell them, no, hey, Coke, we don't want to be a sponsor. And they were like, no, you, you're going to. They threatened my family. The problem is the decimal places place placement yeah. in that yeah. six figures. It's like it's like a peso. Yeah. It's like a peso. Really quick before we get the uh, ten minute warning, there are two movies that I saw uh, since our last episode of the podcast, and I wanted to touch on them a little bit. Yes, uh, but not inappropriately. First off, Babylon. I saw 2022's Babylon. One of two movies that uh, starred Margot Robbie last year that didn't do the best at the box office. Uh, it's a look at the early days of Hollywood. Uh, first off, it's three hours and nine minutes long. Jesus. Really? That, it's long. It is long. And the movie started at 7.35, but when you go to an AMC theater, there's 20 minutes of ads before the movie actually starts. So I'm just there texting. The movie started at 7.35 and it's 10.20 and I'm still here and I don't know when I'm going to leave and I miss my family. <laughs> um, This movie is like a Oscar nominee and it's up for all of these awards and all of this stuff. Um, surprisingly effing filthy yeah. wow wow within the first five minutes an elephant shits over two Mexican men and a naked woman pees on the naked body and inside the mouth of a naked fat man and there's a big ass orgy with a bunch of full frontal nudity in the first Five minutes of Babylon. Okay. It, it's really shocking. You know, like a, you know, like old timey Hollywood, like fatty Arbuckle Hollywood. Yes. That's what the movie's about. Back in the early days when it was just like the Wild West and anything goes and people are drinking and, and going wild. And at first I didn't like it because the movie's just so freaking long, but it was one of those movies where it's like, the next day, two days later, three days later, I'm still thinking about this movie. I I think I liked it. I, this was the first film in a long time where I've been listening to the score. Really? I don't know when the last time was I cared about the score of a movie, but oh man, I love the score of Babylon because so much of the uh so much of the soundtrack to the movie Babylon Damn is one. just Hyperactive jazz music done by, by high people. And it, it so a lot of the music is just like ragtime done by Dave Brubeck, but he's on a shit ton of cocaine. And that's the soundtrack to Babylon. Okay. The movie didn't do too great at the box office, but I think that if they just advertised, hey, Babylon is in theaters now. What's that? You don't want to see it? What if we told you Margot Robbie vomits into an older man's mouth? Yeah, you kind of want to pay $9 now. So come on down and see Babylon. There are people who would pay to see that. Yes, there are. So that was Babylon. I also saw Skinamarink. All right. Yeah, I, I don't even know what that is. Okay. So remember last year when Terrifier 2 came out and they made it for like $250,000, but it made like $10 million at the box office. And everyone's like, oh my goodness, this is, this is the next big thing. A small budget horror movie that broke through the slick Hollywood veneer and all of that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, Skinamarink is this year's Terrifier 2. It is a low budget horror movie done literally for about $17,000. There are only four people who act in the entire film. You don't see anyone's face. It's primarily shots of walls and paintings on walls and people's feet, and you can barely hear what's going on, and it's all grainy, And but it's also kind of creepy as fuck, but it's the cheapest movie in the world, and it's made about a million dollars at the box office. 
And so I said, oh, I'm going to I'm going to watch it. Uh, someone sent me a uh, bootleg copy of it and I watched it and. Uh, the critics love it. The critics are saying, oh, this what a bold artistic choice. But in reality, is it a bold artistic choice or is this just what they could afford? Yes. Anyway, it, it's a real polarizing film. Either you're scared to death of it or it's one of the worst movies you ever saw. A lot of critics so are comparing... So it's the new Blair Witch. Yeah, a lot of critics are calling it the new Blair Witch, and I have to agree because some people will obsess over every frame while others will angrily demand their b money back with the strength of a million Karens. The movie's kind of shit, but this is the new thing. A small budget horror movie makes hits the big time. It's playing at my small ass movie theater. Yeah. And this movie is like nothing. It's one of those movies where it's like, this is horrible. When are we doing this for the podcast? It was one of those movies. <laughs> it is really bizarre. And, and the thing is, is that I didn't like it. It gave me a, a, a headache. Oh, in the beginning, it says uh, all of the cartoons used in this film are in the public domain and were downloaded from archive.org. And the first thing that ran through my mind is, want to be a member is going to be in this. You don't have that as an opening credit yeah. and you don't use uh, Bimbo. No. And they fucking do. I got so excited. I was like, <laughs> yes! Want to be a member! Want to be a member! <laughs> I, was so, I was so excited. But the thing is, is that the movie is super cheap and it's kind of crappy. And everyone has to see it. It's like an event. It's so bad that like I feel like I've been through something that I can share with other people, and I, I, I saw it while whacked out of my mind on pain pills from the uh, surgery that I had. Yeah. So like I really didn't like it, but call me crazy, I might go see it in theaters this week. It, okay. It, it feels like a dream. It's not good, it's not bad, it's an experience, and I really think that everyone should see it, and then we can talk about how much we loved it or hated it. I kind I kind of it regardless of how I feel well, about the movie. Send, send me I, that bootleg. Let's start okay. there. <laughs> okay. I as much as I dislike the movie. I support anyone who manages to make a horror movie for $17,000 and somehow gets it in like a thousand screens in America. I, I support this movie. Yes. It kind of sucks, but I support it. It's the same way I felt about Terrifier and Terrifier 2. I don't know how you got this in this many movies, but good for you and I support you. I don't like your movie, but I support you and your filmmaking endeavors. Yes. So those are the two movies that I saw this week. Skinema Rink this weekend has expanded to a crap ton of theaters. It's playing all over the place. And uh, there's a there's a bootleg somewhere. And I sh I was watching it and Natasha came in and said. Uh, this is a horrible bootleg. And I'm like, that's the thing. This is just how the movie looks. This was made, <laughs> this was made for seventeen thousand dollars. This is one of those movies that teaches you that anyone can be a filmmaker. So, uh, Skin of a Rink, it, it's, it's an experience that everyone should live through. And, and I fully believe that. Support independent movies. This is as independent as you can get. It's like someone went to David Cronenberg and say, here is a video camera that I found. It's from 1987. You have exactly 24 hours to make the movie Poltergeist, but you can't leave the house. You have to only use your family and you can't show anyone's face. And David Cronenberg said, okay, let me just do a little bit of weed and I'll crank this movie out. And that's okay. Skin of a Rink. That's Skin of a Rink. It is very bizarre. There's hardly any dialogue. You don't see anyone's face. It is, it's, it's like an experimental horror film. And okay. there are some people, there are some people out there for whom this movie is just scaring the living shit out of them. And I just wasn't that person. So there you go. 
But for some people, it is literally an absolute nightmare of a movie to go see. Because it, 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 the movie won't show you what's happening. It'll show you a corner of the, of the ceiling while something is happening. And you won't see who's talking. You'll barely hear what they're saying. And also the camera will just stay there for way too long. And it'll start creeping you the fuck out. It feels like a nightmare. Wait, wait, wait. Are you literally a fly on the wall in that case? Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. I don't know who stars in this movie. You never see them. It's just two little kids and their two parents. And then the, the plot of the entire movie is these kids woke up, their parents were gone, along with all the doors and windows in the house. Okay, now put that into an hour and 45 minutes. That's the movie Skin of Marine. Okay. Some people, they're getting the sh literal shit scared out of them. I wasn't that person, but I, 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 I support your hustle, filmmakers. Good for you. So uh, that's our monologue this week. It was about Tostitos and prunes. And uh, hey, if you're at the supermarket, and you see some Tostitos, you should consider exploring their versatility because they might be the answer to everything. But, so that is the lesson. But fuck prunes. Fuck prunes. Fuck prunes. We have established this. Fuck prunes. This is the fuck prunes episode of the podcast. This so is we are going to be a pro a Tostito podcast. Heck yeah. So we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we are going to have our educationally uneducational segment, historic approximations. Today, we are going to be talking about a, a big time movie. The surprising film that it is based on and the protests that occurred as a result of this movie. It okay. is part one of a two parter. We're doing a two-parter, and I'm very excited about both of these parts. But before we get to any of that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. Okay. We will be right back with more of the Popon film after this. Do-do-do-do-do. Do-do-do-do-do. Come on, more snappy, more jazzy. Come on, come on. Doc Severance in it up. Nice. It's certified frustration free packaging. Hmm. Not not frustrating, that's good. I guess I just pull here and uh Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Kate. And we're back with more 
of the Pope on film. Yes. Buddy! Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, The Pope on Film. I mean, who isn't? It, it's sweeping the nation. We 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 have fans. We're like we're like the flight of the concords of podcasts in that we don't have fans. We have fan. Yes. We have a fan and that's Mel. <laughs> <laughs> but uh only the real fans, the true fans, the hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning, only they would know the two basic facts about the both of us. The two undeniably really real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the both of us, America's hottest will they or won't they couple, Bunny and Malin. First and foremost, the first fact, Bunny, which is about you, is that when you are not doing the podcast, you are making quite a name for yourself in the world of gourmet cupcakes you have become a very big gourmet cupcake uh baker chef however you want to be uh yes. referred. um so tell us bunny how did you get started in that field what drew it to you and what sort of cupcake flavors are you coming up with well the biggest trick of this is that it Caught on first in a very well-to-do neighborhood. Uh, and w the real trick is, is that these are very, very, very exclusive gourmet cupcakes, which means I rarely ever actually bake a cupcake. There's nice. just a waiting list for the cupcakes, and I make the money off of the waiting list itself. Oh my god, it's like Ron Swanson and his chairs. Yeah. It's exactly what this is. Ron Swanson only makes like five chairs a year, and there's a waiting list for his chairs. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and it nice. is it is very it is a very big status symbol amongst the rich to be on my cupcake. Nice, nice, good for you. Get that hustle, get that gain. The edibles yeah. just kicked in. Now, just to let everyone know, for all of you playing playing along at home. Now the secret to the cupcakes itself is the very, very rare ingredients used in the cupcakes. Ooh, like what? Which makes the cupcakes themselves rare. Meteor dust... Nice. Is, ...is one ingredient, and, you know, it's very, very hard to collect media, meteor dust. Yeah. You know, and... You can't really just get a meteor. Yeah. David Bowie sweat. David Bowie sweat. Yes. Hard to get. That is very hard to get, especially now. There is a big been, been a big shortage of David Bowie sweat as David Bowie dries out. Here's another rare ingredient. Muppet teeth. Muppet teeth. Those are hard to get. Those are those very are hard, hard to, to get. get. Yeah. Are, mostly because those little fuckers are so fast. They are fast. Jesus, you take out the pliers and they are gone. Oh my God, where did I hear that? Where did I hear that? Where did that come from? The MTV's The State. They had a skit where uh, uh, like this rich family were eating a uh, Muppet meat and the way that they, uh, Oh, how do you catch the Muppet? Oh, really easy. Gee, I wish someone could tell me how to count to five. And then a Muppet appears in the window and then they catch it and beat the shit out of it. <laughs> it's like, Ooh, let me try. I wish someone could sing a song to me about how to watch my hands. And then boom. A Muppet shows up. That's how you do it. You got to con them. Yeah. 
you know? My wife's work setup is great. I've got three screens. I feel like prof- I feel like I'm either uh, an actual professional podcaster for once, or I'm, I'm just playing real life Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, and I got a bunch of screens. Uh, my kids are obsessed with the Five Nights at Freddy's games, and uh, I. They their minds got blown because a Blumhouse is working on a big budget Hollywood movie version of Five Nights at Freddy's and they cast it and they cast two names in it. First off, PETA, the little uh loser from uh the Hunger Games. There was the handsome one, and then there was the crappy one that made bread and pretended to be a rock. That guy. And um Matthew Lillard. And my kids are like, I don't know who that is. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Because he's been fucking shaggy for about 25 years. Yeah. So so they're freaked out. Like, jeepers. I have to last five nights at Freddy's. I can't. That's the closest I can do at a moment's notice to a shaggy voice. But, um... Matthew Lillard just has a has a kind of presence like you would really just want to hang out with Matthew Lillard. Like that sounds like a fun time. Yeah. Just yeah. palling around and you would get into you you would get into you wouldn't get into trouble with Matthew Lillard, but you would get into hijinks. Yeah, uh hanging out with Matthew Lillard I would imagine is like an invention exchange from mystery science theater. You and Matthew Lillard go out, you have a few shots. Next thing you know, you wake up with a hangover and a tattoo that says Mingo. Yes. That's hanging out with Matthew Lillard. Uh, So that's the first fact (laughs) about bloody. The second fact, Oh, it's fine that we spent so much time talking about this. It's not like I have a huge chef, a huge half coming up. Um, the second fact, which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So what I like to do at this portion of the podcast is I like to get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well and reworded via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz. And that's what this is. Another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations, or as we like to call it, I just freaked out some other people in the house. Formerly, oh, oh, Hap. Dramatic music. Dun, dun, dun. Thank you. Formerly known as Steve's <laughs> Historic Approximations, or Shap, as we like to call it, repeatedly annoyingly, whether anyone wanted us to or not. But uh, as catchy as the name Shap was, a dead name is a dead name for a reason, and so we're moving on. So what is happening on the Hap this week? This week, we are talking about a legendary big-budget Hollywood movie that bombed spectacularly. Except it didn't. And the odd-as-heck protests that spawned as a result. And this is a two-parter. Because originally, the protests were going to be the focus of this uh, segment. But then I learned some. Some new shit came to light, man. Oh. Uh, she fucking kidnapped herself. Bunny. Bunny kidnapped herself. Yes. So, uh, so now there's a two-parter because I uncovered some things. But, okay. So, Bunny, it's, it's 1930 in America. It's 1930. So, uh, everyone is doing the Charleston flappers are pushing hoops down the street with big long sticks which was the style at the time uh i tied an onion to my belt newsies are selling papes on every street corner it's a menace uh eventually the president would just start slaughtering them and uh everything is in black and white now that's friggin history it's a fact uh, where am there, I? Okay. There, there you go with your critical race theory. Yeah, basically. Ruining, ruining. 
we we're at a part of history in America where the old white people who in the 50s and 60s uh treated minorities horribly are now in their 60s and 70s and 80s and are running the nation and are stopping people from learning about how shitty they were. Yes. That is where we are in America right now. So it's the it's 1930 and there's a movie producer at RKO Pictures whose name is Ernest B. Shodasak. Jesus, that's a triple word score. Ernest B. Shodasak. Yeah. Ernest B. Shodasak, honey. You just showing your tits on camera? No, I've got I've got I've got a, a, a brawlet. I'm I'm if anything, it's a tribute to Selena, the music star. No, I'm early 80s Madonna, lucky star, borderline. But when this podcast gets to my Papa Don't Preach phase, that's when people will tune out. Yes. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> Ernest B. showed us that. Ernie B. works for RKO Pictures, which was a big time movie How studio. exactly does a name such as show the sack come around s c h o e d sack so i'm not exactly sure i'm i'm not sure if it's if it's pronounced show the sack but that's how i'm pronouncing it ernest b show the sack ernie b he worked for rko pictures i didn't look into rko pictures but i'm assuming that rko pictures was a big time movie studio Founded by Randy Orton's great grandfather. Okay. And he was known for just doing like a diamond cutter neck breaker on people. I'm like, just thinking yeah. that with a name like Shodasak, you know exactly what you're getting when you sign up for that OnlyFans. Yeah, pretty much. And Ernie B, I'm going to call him Ernie B because that's a lot easier than having to say Shodasak over and over again. Feel like I'm gonna summon something. Uh, Good, because so, I'm gonna giggle every time you say it. So, okay. yes, so we don't. Ernie, Ernie B has made RKO some money with monkey pictures. Okay. Monkey pictures. Oh, here's a movie about this guy, and he's a traveler in the Congo, traveling. Fighting monkeys. Oh, here's this guy, and he has to fight this monkey to save this girl. And oh, here's another monkey picture. So he's made some money with monkeys. Ernie B is the monkey guy at Arkea. Okay. So then a rival studio Which comes has me that. intrigued and in thinking yeah. many things already. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll let you know when to put the pictures up. Do you got those, Bunny? Yes, I do. Okay. So. Ernie B is the monkey guy at RKO. And they've made a decent amount of money with these stupid little monkey pictures. So then there's this other studio. They're called Congo Pictures. And they're like, um, it's the 30s. So monkey pics are boppo, baby boy, howdy, yowza, 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 23 skidoo, or whatever. Because um, it's the 1930s. Is, is So we need to make a big time monkey picture. And ours will be different. So put a woman in peril in it, barely dressed, because it's the pre-code era. So, uh, and so Congo Pictures releases, some person has an idea. It's like, what if we made, hear me out, it's 1930, I've got this idea for a movie, it's crazy, hear me out. What if we made a documentary That wasn't true. Oh, a a a a a mockumentary. Someone might say. So, what if we make a documentary, but we just frigging lie about everything? So they did. They made a fake documentary, and it's called Ingagi. Cue picture number one. That this thing is pre-code. Look at that poster. That's some pre-haze code right there. Cause look yeah. at them titties. Yeah. That is crazy. We need to black box those. 
Anyway, this fake documentary is racist AF. It was billed as an authentic documentary where a famed explorer named Sir Hubert Winstead traveled from London, England to his, the African Congo to be the first person ever to, to capture on camera a, a rare African ritual where native women are kidnapped and given to the mighty gorillas of the jungle as sex slaves. So a couple of things. Number one, it was filmed in L.A. Uh, number two, it looks like it was filmed in L.A. in the exact same park where they, where they, uh, where uh, Bella Lugosi is like a uh, wrestling with a rubber octopus at three yeah. a.m. Even what happened even the, the picture, same? even huh? the picture. Looks like a drawing of a guy in an ape suit. Yeah, holding a real doll without a wig. That's exactly what it looks like, yeah. So it was filmed in L.A. There was no Sir Hubert Winstead. The gorillas are a mix of stock footage and dudes in cheap-ass gorilla suits. It is racist AF. We went to Africa where uh, African women have sex with monkeys. Can you believe that the blacks do this? That's the, the entire plot of the entire movie. But it was uh, billed. It was billed as an actual real life movie. And, and people flocked to the freaking movie theater because they thought this shit was real. Because no one had ever made a fake documentary before. And when does this movie come out? 1930. Okay. So uh, it's racist AF. It's a film that one YouTuber called a lost film. No. No, YouTuber. Just because people don't know a film that well, don't make it lost. It's not lost. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's out there. You can find it. Yeah, Another it's YouTuber... not lost if you can find it. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Another YouTuber called it the world's first found footage film. And uh, no, it's not a found footage film. It's not a lost film. Uh, and to be clear, yes, I did fucking find it. And yes, we will do it eventually. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But one day we will be doing in Gaggy for the freaking podcast. Okay. I done found it. It got into a lot of legal trouble. It, the story of in Gaggy is so crazy that... That's why this is a two-parter. Because originally, I was just going to talk about this one topic, and then suddenly I learn about this weird-ass fake documentary where uh, women are having sex with, with, gorilla, with gorillas. So uh, next week, we'll be going in-depth about Ngagi. Yeah. But here's what you need to know now. Fake documentary, a crazy hit, it made millions. It is estimated that Ngangi made four million dollars in 1930. Wow! In 1930, and eventually the U.S. government had to get involved. But that is for next week. the The point is, Ngangi Ngagi is relatively unknown. But let me tell you what shouldn't be unknown. Here's the here's the real meat of the story. And you may have sensed this, Bunny. Um, no RKO executive has ever admitted this. No RKO executive would ever admit this. The people responsible for this legendary property would never be caught back. Admitting this. However, <clears throat> it's fairly obvious that RKO executive looked at the success of this fake racist ass mockumentary, this cheaply made exploitation film, and said, hey, Ernie B, this Ngangi film is making bank. 
So do us a favor. Copy it. Make a monkey flick. Make a monkey flick for RKO. A big prestige monkey flick. Here's a ton of money. Just make it the biggest and best monkey flick there's ever been. Just make it just like in Gagi. A camera group. A documentary. Uh, women in peril. Scantily clad outfits. Being given to monkeys. Monkeys that want to fuck them. Fuck monkeys. Fuck monkeys. Do it. And I'm sorry, but my friends... This is legitimately how King Kong was made. Haven't you ever wondered that, like, oh, in every itineration of King Kong, there's a 100-foot-tall monster that wants to fuck a 5-foot-tall model? Yes. Haven't you ever wondered why? It's because of this racist freaking movie right here. Well, even when you were describing the the filmmaker, I was like, I, I was like, that literally just is Carl Denham. Yeah. That, that's exactly the Carl Denham character. Yeah. He makes but, monkey films. Yeah. So RKO saw the popularity of this fake movie and turned this fake movie into a big budget epic prestige film. And everyone remembered that <sighs> and forgot where the idea originally came from, which is right here in this grindhouse fake documentary. Uh, 1933's original King Kong is just a big budget ripoff of a horribly racist fake documentary. Now that's it for Ngagi this week. Next week, we'll go deep into that film. Uh, hence the two-parter. Be sure to join us next week as we discuss the racist King Kong prequel and the problems it got into with the U.S. government. But for now, we're talking about 1933's King Kong. Groundbreaking special effects. The movie made millions. It was even more successful than Ngongi, Ngagi. And of course, the most iconic scene of the film is the ending where King Kong climbs the M&M store. Oh, wait. I wrote that <laughs> wrong. The Empire State Building. But who? It's the 70s, baby. Everyone's disco dancing. Everyone's getting it. And then, you know what they're doing with it? Putting their weight on it. Because that's yes. what you do. You put your weight on it. Put your weight on it. Put your weight on it. Everyone is smoking grass in Vietnam, and babies are being born with fully grown sideburns. They are literally popping out of the womb, sliding out of the slip and slide vagina of their mom already wearing bell-bottom jeans. That is freaking history. Uh, and this is how the story goes. There are two stories. One story is almost 100% real, and the other story is bullshit and sounds like Tommy Wiseau. So this is how it goes. The one story is Michael Eisner, pre-Disney CEO. Michael Eisner is uh, watching TV. He sees King Kong on and he goes, hey, here's a fairly decent idea. Let's uh, remake King Kong. So he tells the CEO of Paramount Pictures his idea and they say, okay, we'll put a producer on it. Uh, hey, Dino De Laurentiis, uh, we're going to remake King Kong. We'll give you a crap ton of money. Just go and make this. And so, and he says, uh, okay, I will go and make this film for you, studio executives. That is how it probably happened. But of course, you talk to Dino De Laurentiis, and he says, yes, the whole film was my ideas. The ideas was mine entirely. I say, I say to friends, hey, let's do remake of American King Kong movie film. And it was my idea because I genius. And I, to be clear, I wrote in parentheses, May Lin, say this in a Tommy Wiseau voice. And I think I nailed it. Not bad. Not I bad at it. all. Thank you. Thank you. So they decide to redo King Kong, but for the gritty 1970s. Okay, picture me. This, now you can put up the second picture. Um, now look, I am not going to tackle the entirety of the making okay, of 19... okay, no, you gotta stop there because that was totally confusing because you said picture me and I, I I wasn't sure what you meant. I thought maybe oh, no. I you said wanted me to B. picture you as Fay Ray. No, picture B 
is what oh. I said. Not picture me, picture B. A common okay. mistake. Common mistake. So uh, I'm not going to tackle the entirety of the making of 1976 as King Kong because there have been massive tomes written about how much of a, a, a shit show the making of that movie was. But here's a few bullet points. Jessica Lange plays the young damsel in distress. She was a freaking model who had never acted a day in her life. Yes. Ever. And that just blows my mind because she is amazing in American Horror Story. And sometimes when I hear uh, David Bowie's Life on Mars, uh, in the year 2060, scientists estimate that one out of every three movie trailers will have David Bowie's song Life on Mars during the trailer. Okay. That's yeah. just science. It's amazing. So, uh, but she's such a great actress now, but like, dang, she, she, well, that was she an uphill also, battle because she, she didn't know shit. She had also picked up critical acclaim quickly. Just not for this. <laughs> yeah, just not for this. That's crazy risky just getting this person who has never acted before to be the the star of your film. I love Jeff Bridges as the hippie scientist. But then even this part we could look back see like when you first see a really great actor you just kind of think that's who they are. You know? So seeing Tony Collette in The Sixth Sense, you just figure, uh, you, know, you know, she's just like kind of not exactly high class Brooklyn working woman, single mom, you know, and that's just kind of who she is. Yeah. And then when you see later performances, you realize what kind of an actor they are and how genius that is. So the same thing kind of applies to Jessica Lange, who now having recognized what a great actress she is and what a talent she is, for her to, blow, to pull off the part of a complete bubble-headed fucking bimbo. Yeah. That's talent. Yeah, it is. It's talent. Yeah. So, uh, Jeff Bridges I'm is a sure hippie scientist. I'm sure she hated herself every day of it. But I, I have never been more attracted to Jeff Bridges as I am in the movie King Kong. Yeah. I'm just saying. Like, he's been in a lot of movies and a lot of different characters, but uh, King Kong Jeff Bridges can get it. Okay. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis <laughs> wanted this to be such a massive, epic film that Crazy ass mofo built a robot. He built a Megazord. He built yes. a Voltron. Yes. It's freaking crazy. He, he, so, this robot was 40 feet tall and weighed almost seven tons. It cost $61,000 to build in 1976. In today's money, that would cost uh, a, about $300,000. But uh, he also built that's robotic. Still, that still sounds relatively cheap for me for a giant fucking ape robot. Yeah, it was also, it, but also it <clears throat> wasn't just that robot. He also built a separate giant mechanical arms and giant mechanical hands for, you know, the close ups and stuff like that. So all together, the building of the, the robot and its various parts was one million dollars. In 1976, money, and it's so great because as it, there's the picture right there, right there yes. of yes. the robot sucker barely worked, and they only show it for 15 seconds of worm. screen time. So it's only up there for 15 seconds of screen time, and I love that. It is so fake. It's hilarious. Yeah, even in that 15 seconds, it's just horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, like, you can see the the person in the monkey outfit going, ah, ah, and then it cuts to a shot where you see 
King Kong going. Yeah. All slow and it's freaking hilarious. The script was written by Lorenzo Semple Jr. And I heard that name and I went, that sounds familiar. Turns out he wrote the dumbass 60s Batman. Oh. Which is why in the 1976 King Kong movie, when the hippie scientist uh, Jeff Bridges punches Charles Grodin's greedy oil executive in the face, you can just see this big uh, title screen that says, Bah! Yeah. Uh, you know who is in 1976's King Kong? B movie actor John Agar has yeah. a small part in King Kong as city official. He starred in Invisible Invaders, Journey to the Seventh Planet, Attack of the Puppet People, The Mole People, Revenge of the Creature, Tarantula, and most notably, put up picture six John Agar's eyes shot lasers on the poster for 1957's The Brain from Planet Eris. Yes. So yeah, he's in it. I thought that I did, that's a bit odd. That's right up there with the fact that Roger Corman is in Apollo 13. Yes. And it's like, oh. Oh. Well, that shouldn't be there. But okay. <laughs> uh, whatever. Sure. So yeah, the creation of the King Kong reboot was a shit show. But here's the kicker. The chewy center of the story. This was and originally... It was, and it was huge. Before we belabor the point, uh, I was there. It was fucking... This was being built up as... Like, Star Wars hadn't come out yet, but this was ma meant to be a blockbuster, huge yeah. movie. And that was one of the things that I wanted to mention in this historic approximation, is that a lot of people say that this is a bomb, but it wasn't a bomb. This was a success. This was all over the place. They sold a shit ton of merchandise. It was everywhere. This film was a hit. But I read a crap ton of articles about King Kong to make this a uh, historic approximation. And everyone said the same thing. Well, Jaws ended up making this much amount of money. King Kong ain't Jaws. Yeah. Get King Kong out your damn mouth. Stop comparing. Stop comparing Jaws to King Kong. These aren't the same films. It, this is exactly what they did with the American Godzilla movie. That was a hit. It made like 500 million, 600 million. Sure, nobody liked it, but it still sold tickets. Yes. <laughs> just because just because people thought it was cheesy and stupid doesn't mean that it wasn't a success. So now people think that this movie bombed, but it didn't bomb. Let me tell you what bombed, the freaking sequel, but that's a totally different story. Yes. Uh, so Dino De Laurentiis, when it, it was his, uh, when he decided to make this movie, he had two very specific ideas for this new 1970s version of King Kong. Number one, uh, he wants it set in the present day. So it'll be set in 1976. And number two, instead of having the climax take place on the Empire State Building, oh, I've got an idea. B, I've got a great new place that we can have King Kong uh, climb on because it's new, it's shiny, it's iconic, and it will no doubt stand tall forever. The world... The twin, the World Trade Center. Yes. The Twin Towers. So that is where uh, the climactic ending of 1976's King Kong happens. It happens uh, at the World Trade Center. And uh, to be fair, 1970, in terms of King Kong climbing things, 1976 is an outlier. 1970, yeah. 1976 is King Kong is to the King Kong franchise what um like 
a Halloween H2. Like it, it's what uh uh Rob Zombie's Halloween movies are to the Halloween franchise. Yes. It can be I mean, accepted and and trust me again, I am I am hardcore King Kong. Okay? Yeah. It is my Thanksgiving ritual. King Kong is yeah. highly highly King Kong centric. Uh No, it's not it, it's it's not really quite a King Kong movie, but it no. has its own charm. Yeah. Uh so even even if you went to Jeff Bridges and said, "Hey, what is King Kong climb?" he would say, "Yeah. He climbs the Empire State Building." So, um this is the reason why I wrote this historic approximations. I saw a picture of a protest. Apparently, uh, everyone's like, oh, King Kong's going to be climbing the World Trade Center. That's awesome. Yeah, but you know who didn't think it was awesome? Employees at the Empire State Building. Okay. So they protested the 1976 King Kong. They climbed to the 102nd floor of the Empire State Building, and they picketed with picket signs and chants, and all of them, here is the great part, they all wore cheap gorilla outfits. Oh. To protest, and I saw this picture on Instagram, and here's the thing, I will find a picture or a meme or an article, and I'll screenshot something, and I'll put it on my computer. And so on my computer, I've got like 30 pictures of upcoming shafts. But for whatever reason, I didn't save this one freaking picture. My wife and I spent a whole day online trying to find the picture of this protest. And of course we couldn't. It's Tostitos all over again. Oh, there's no picture. But I saw the picture. I know the picture exists. So put up the fourth picture. I couldn't find the picture. So I thought, what picture should I put for the fourth and final picture? How about I'll just pick a random picture to get Bunny off the trail of what this uh, segment will be about. So instead of posting a picture of King Kong, I've, it's a picture of Donald Trump and Grimace. Hooray! Misdirection. Yes. Nice. It, it, let's not forget that Donald Trump was the first president to ever win a hair versus hair match at a WrestleMania. Yes. And Donald Trump was the first ever uh, president to not only cross the demarcation line and go into North Korea, but he was also the first president to ever have a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Grimace. Yes. This is a big deal. This, this yes. is huge. This is like the Nixon Frost interviews. So that's it for his And he came process. very, very close from getting from getting Grimace and Ronald to shake hands it's after crazy. all those I've years. I've but seen video he failed. I've seen video of their meeting and Grimace is just yelling in Russian and slamming a a, a shoe onto a table. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Grimace was gonna bomb Florida. It was insane. So that's it for historic approximations this week. Next week, we tackle the true story of America's first mockumentary in Gagi and how freaking racist it is. Uh, if you're interested, it's on YouTube. It's on archive.org. It's all over the freaking place. It's racist as hell. But that's next week. Join us next week for more educationally uneducational fun with historic approximations or HAP! And cut on that. In this halftime, we are going to take a short break, but chill out. We're going to have some cartoons, some music, some fun. And when we come back, we will be tackling this week's movie, if it can be called that, the 1982 slasher, I guess, called Blood Beat. So that is coming up soon. So. Oh, hey there, my little leg rolls. It's me, Dabney, the fucking alien. I love 
have you been asking to hear more about Theta Prime B? Theta Prime B is more advanced than Earth by 20 years. It'll give you a glimpse into your future. We have more disease and ecological catastrophes than you can imagine in your darkest dystopian nightmares. We have winds so strong that it picks up livestock. You never know when it's going to start raining cows. Large chunks of land have been swallowed up by the ocean, and there have been frequent Kevin Costner sightings. We have 48 variants of COVID-19, 27 variants of Ebola, and a collection of diseases released by the melting ice caps, collectively known as climate fever. We found that if you make a solution of silly putty, vodka, and snot, and inject that directly into your cock, it'll stop most diseases from entering your body. Trust me, I'm an alien. For now, enjoy these videos from Undead Cow Studios and the Pope on Film. And I think Ted Cruz is a great guy. I think Social Security should be pri uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. Hello, everybody. It's me, Reverend Stephen. Today, we're going to be doing a little taste test. I live in Oklahoma, more specifically Shawnee, Oklahoma, which is where the first ever Sonic drive-in restaurant was uh, started. This, this town is the birthplace of Sonic. There's one, two, three, four within driving distance. So they just recently announced I say recently, a couple of months ago. They announced that they were working on a hard seltzer because everything has to have a hard seltzer now. Everything. They're going to make the blood of Christ hard seltzer. Everything has to be a hard seltzer. And I've been looking and looking and looking for it because I, I feel that Sonic food is okay. It's fine. Cat, no. Fuck off. Stop getting on my goddamn computer. Sonic food is fine. It's okay. It's all right. But what keeps bringing me back to Sonic is two things, Cherry Limeade and Ocean Water. So today I found Sonic Ocean Water Hard Seltzer. And uh, I, I have, it's 5% alcohol per volume, 100 calories and one gig of sugar. <laughs> One gig of sugar. They they also sell it in a variety pack. That kind of smells like ocean water. They also sell it in a variety pack, and what I've heard is that two of the variety pack are great, and the others are shit. And so you're stuck with a bunch of uh, drinks that you won't ever want to drink. So I figured, since o ocean water and cherry limeade are the absolute best drinks at Sonic, that it's a 50-50 chance that I'll like this. Anyway, let's give it a try. Down the hatch. You're just doing a little dance on the side? Oh, for the dog. Okay, yeah, you gotta do a dance for the dog. There's no good way to say this. This tastes like a water park. This tastes like sunscreen. This tastes like the water park inside of the California State Fairgrounds. The lazy river and the wave pool. And oh no, I've gotten a little bit of the water of the wave pool in my mouth. That's what this tastes like. But I, I don't know, it does taste like ocean water. It, I mean, whether or not I like the taste. Cat, I swear to fucking God. It does taste a lot like a water park. 
Uh, but I don't know. I think this is all right. It, not a thumbs up. You get a thumb, a diagonal thumb, one diagonal thumb. It's not a thumbs up, and it's not a thumbs down. But it's not even a thumb sideways. It's 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 like a, it's one of these thumbs. I wouldn't go out and buy another twelve pack. But if my choices were a Budweiser and this, I'm getting this. Yes. So, there you go. Sonic Hard Seltzer. These are hard to find. I've been looking for them for the longest freaking time, and I finally found one. So if you can, if you can find one, just get it just to try it. This is all right. I'd rather have this than a freaking LaCroix, I can tell you that. Rather have this than a, than a, what is that thing that all the freaking white people are drinking? White Claw. White Claw! Rather have this than a White Claw. This has more taste to it. Wow. I look good right now. Hey. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so that's my taste test. Sonic, hard seltzer, ocean water. It's all right. It's all right. Thanks for watching. Be sure and like and subscribe. See you later. On the death of John McCain, Lindsey Graham was forced to roam the halls of Congress in search of another set of balls to lick. Luckily, Trump's nutsack was within sniffing distance. No matter how many times Trump hurled insults at Lindsey Graham's best dead friend, Lindsey sucked up that scrotum like Thursday's soup. Oh, you're the best golfer I've ever seen, Mr. Trump. Ooh, you bring a kind of magic to the Republican Party, Mr. Trump. Lindsey Graham. What a fucking beta cup. Check out this video by our friend Tim Caldwell. In the village of Santo Palo, there is celebration. We bake mighty fine pastries this week. Yes, indeed, many fine cakes and cookies. It will bring lots of money to the village. In fact, I have announcement to make. We have finally made enough money that we can buy every whisk oh. and give Mama Rosa a rest. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now I can die I'm happy. <laughs> Let the celebrations continue. Not so fast. Who are you? Oh. I am Sean Connery. I have come for your gold. Any objections? No! 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 Oh. No objections? Senor, we are a poor village of bakers. And one prostitute. We have no gold. Just the ingredients to make our pastries. You are a village of bakers? Then I will take your ingredients. Ocho Cinco will stop you! I am afraid of no man whose name has four syllables. I will take your supplies. But first, those pancakes you made this morning weren't fluffy enough, woman. Ah! Oh, no! Oh, no! Who dares take these ingredients from these people? I do. Then I shall stop you. Wrap it up, man. Melrose is on at nine, please.
Do you think he's dead? I don't know. Is he breathing? Let's take his wallet. Who did this to me? It was that gringo, Sir Ocho. You shot me? I came here to defend this village against evil and you shot me? This will not go unpunished. I am Ocho Cinco and I... You shot me again. Who do you think you are? Don't you know guns are... Please stop shooting me. It's okay. I'm out of bullets anyway. Good. Now we will fight like men. No. I'm not used to hitting men. I will take my leave of you and your crappy village. But mark my words, Ocho. I'll be back. I won. Ocho, you have saved us! Oh, you have made our village safe again! Thank you, Ocho! I will always protect this village against the gringos and the vampire wizards. There are lots of things a woman does not need, but every woman needs a man! I'll go find you one. The village is safe thanks to Ocho Sinkhole. Until next week, what the fuck is this? Hi! 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 Hi!
film this this podcast is inevitable and he is a very as a asmr nice asmr thanos yeah goodbye bye thanos and thanks for stopping by and we're back hooray uh thank you max oh maxwell hi well, where 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 have you been i yeah i don't know oh uh, well now you're blurry it's time buddy it's time it's time yes bunny my friend it is time once again for all of us here at the pope on film podcast to moonwalk our way into the second act of the show and it is said second act wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all new extra strength and now available without a prescription movie of the week and this this week is the first time this year uh, in January, in the year of our Lord, 2023, the first episode, wherein we take a deep, deep dive into the strange and esoteric world of film. And this time, it is the utterly batshit, bizarre, early 80s slasher, I guess, a film called Blood Bee, which is free on YouTube somehow. You should watch it. It's insane. Uh... I say the first film where we take a deep, deep dive into the strange and esoteric. This is not a concrete, but what I would like to do is throughout this year, 2023, we watch uh, a popular movie, a good movie, a mainstream movie. And then after that, we watch some of the weirdest shit we can. Yes. And so last episode, we watched Marcel the Shell with Shoes on, one of my favorite movies of the year. And so uh, this week, we're doing a bizarre film called Blood Beat. Uh, this movie does not give a fuck what you think, what you want, no. what you're looking for in a film, what you think a film should be. What the rules of cinema are, what makes sense, or how much glowing is too much glowing in a horror film. This movie does not care at all. Bunny messaged me <laughs> and said that Bloodbeat glows more than the movie Xanadu. And I'd like to add to that Bloodbeat glows more than the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Although I still think Jeannie has the quote. Yes. This is a really good movie if you don't watch it. Yeah. Yeah, if it's just on, then yeah. Oh yeah, this is a wonderful movie. I like the fact because that, she was she was liking the music. Yeah. <clears throat> and what I was noticing is that 
for a lot of the beginning of the movie, nothing was happening except the music. Yeah, that's a good point. I like the fact that for my graphic on the screen, you use the movie Tombstone because I have been to Tombstone a lot. Tombstone, Arizona is in the southeastern corner of Arizona, right next to Douglas, Arizona, which is where my grandparents lived. Yeah, And so I spent a lot of time in Tombstone. It's really weird because you're walking down the street and then, oh, there's a Circle K. There's a 7-Eleven. There is a Carl's Jr. And then you take a right and, okay, there's a uh, there's a, a bank and there's a movie theater. And then you take a left and here's the street exactly how it's been since the Wild West times. Yes. And no cars are driving. Everyone's riding horses and everyone's dressed in old time. It's a real weird trip. Uh, Tombstone is crazy. Uh, wow, I would love to go there high. Uh, <laughs> now that I think about it, that would be crazy. Um, this movie is utterly bizarre. Bonnie, I've got a question for you. How many... Like in your life, in your lifetime, uh, how old are you? 42? In your 42 years of life, how many samurai induced orgasms have you had? Uh, 37. 37. 37? Yeah. Uh, that's a good number. Uh, I really got into Kurosawa for a while. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. I love the mom, and I love the fact that you have a picture of her, so that this makes it better. She looks like one of two things. Number one, you tried to buy Shelley Duvall on Wish. Yes. And number two, that is Bert the Muppet definitely came out of her JJ. Yes. She she's got a huge, especially in that picture. She's got a huge Bert vibe. She looks like she would traumatize children enough that they would grow up being really into pigeons and bottle cap collecting. Yes, that is, that is who that woman is. This, um, this just in general, the acting I found really kind of strange because. All of the acting was very one note. Yeah. But they kind of played that one note fairly well. Yeah. Yeah. This movie feels like... one like... girl was there just to get hysterical and be hysterical. Yeah. And she was pretty good at being hysterical. This but she movie... was hysterical the whole fucking time. Yeah, this movie has a vibe, and the best way that I can explain it is this is Troll 2's cousin. It's not Troll 2's sister. It's not Troll yeah. 2's brother. It's not Troll 2's father. No, distant cousin. Yeah. Because this is a film made by foreigners in America with an American cast written by a foreigner. This is basically a, a drug addict from France's impression of what the Midwest is. Yes. That's what this film is. Y you know what else this movie gave me vibes of? Larry Cohen. Yeah. Like I could watch Blood Beat and God Told Me To in a double feature. And if you told me it was made by the same person, I'd go, okay, whatever. Sure. It's enough glowing. Yeah, true. I can kind of see that. Did we do God Told Me To? Did we? I think uh, we did. I don't, I'm I not feel, sure. I, I don't feel think like so. We did. I feel like we did because Andy Kaufman's in it. And I feel like, I feel, I don't know. Dang, I'm going to have to go back and see. Okay. Um. And now I'm pissed off. So I went to the website Letterboxd, which I never do. Uh, and I pulled some reviews of this bizarre 1982 uh, oddity, and I'm going to hit you with some reviews. Okay, Bunny? Okay. Okay. 
a rural Midwestern translation of Hausu. Okay, yeah. I love that. I, love I can kind of get behind that. A no-budget regional slasher sought in so shot in someone's backyard. Nice. Yeah. There's weird movies, and then there's Blood Beat. And this last one is my favorite review of Blood Beat. This is basically... <laughs> this is basically the shark sandwich of reviews. Okay. Yes, in Spinal Tap, uh, your album Shark Sandwich, it was just a two-word review. It just said shit sandwich. So my favorite review of Blood Beat on Letterboxd just says drugs. Okay. And that is exactly it. That is exactly it, just to be clear. So, so yeah, uh, what I'm saying is, the point I'm trying to get across here, convey, is that the 1982 film Bloodbeat is fucking weird. Buddy, what are your yes. thoughts on this movie? What are your thoughts? It's enjoyably bad. Yes, yes, it's enjoyably bad. It's Troll 2's cousin. Once, once we kind of get going, and it has a kind of slasher vibe in that I really wanted to see them all die. It felt like it, this was this did come out in 1982, right about the time that the slasher genre was like coming into fruition. But it, it, looking at it now, so far removed from when it came out. The the movie feels like it's the 80s and they're making slashers and the directors are all saying, uh, OK, so here's the premise. If teens have sex, they get killed. And then Bloodbeat said, hold my beer. Yeah. How about people get killed and then there's sex? Yeah. You know, like, oh, he put a twist on it. He put a twist on it. I sh I, sh I watched. uh. This is Spinal Tap with my kids, and they did not give a crap. But I was surprised at how much of that movie, it had been a while, I was surprised at how much of that movie I still have memorized to a T. But, yeah. And also, let me just skip to the end. Who names their dog Chooky? <laughs> I'm so confused. I'm so in the weeds with Chooky. Why did you name your dog Chooky? Where did that name come from? Why Chooky? I'm so confused. You know what this movie gave me vibes of, especially in the kitchen scene where uh, the supernatural entity is throwing things all over the place and pats, uh, pats, pots and pans. Yeah. I said pats and pawns. That was amazing. That's why sitcoms are dying. Uh, that whole scene gave me vibes of Trumpy. No. Yeah. So, so there's that too. Hunter boyfriend Gary has some real big stepfather vibes. Yes. Oh, this is my mom, and this is my stepdad, Gary. Gary's a dick. Plus, he, he, you know, it, to keep in the Trumpy uh, uh, mindset, uh, Hunter boyfriend Gary does look like he has a real huzzah vibes. Can you stop licking on the side of the screen? This is the internet. We want people to see the podcast, but not for this. I am serious, okay? You stop doing that. Stop. Stop. I am serious, Eleanor. I am serious. Okay? I will say I had more fun with uh, Bloodbeat than I did Skinamarink, but that's different. Funny, here is your biggest challenge. The biggest challenge ever. Okay. Can you tell us the plot of Bloodbeat? Yeah, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> the... the, the... 
spend way too much time setting up very strained drama uh and you you find out what each one of their their characters are so you know we, we have fairly calm boyfriend we have hysterical girlfriend who was hysterical right from the beginning your mom doesn't like me and she was fucking hysterical about that and she stayed hysterical through the whole thing um mom's nuts no mom has psychic mind powers and she's nuts and Don't you hate it when your psychic mom spies on you having sex? I hate that. Yeah. It's like, damn. Like, like uh, everyone in the family needed to wear Magneto helmets. Yes. Dad doesn't know how to express love. Yes. You know, uh, kind of typical shit. Uh, and... They go hunting... And hysterical girl freaks out that they shot a deer while hunting. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, like, I, I, I don't understand. Like, like, what did you think hunting was? Like, this is like if you asked her bowling. And then she freaked out because you threw a ball at some pins. Yeah. It's like, what did you think was, was going on here? Yeah. You're going hunting. She was hysterical about that. Uh, <clears throat> there was a guy with a, with a sucking chest wound. Yes. I, I, I really don't know what he had to exactly do with anything. But there was a guy. He had a sucking chest wound. Yeah. I, I think they dealt with it somehow. Not really uh-huh. clear how. But we can assume that the situation was dealt with, I guess. Uh, and then there was a killer ghost samurai. Yes. Like you get sometimes you know like sometimes you just get them like they didn't they things. didn't read an ancient book or uh wash nope. an ancient statue or you know anything any of the normal things that one might do that releases an ancient evil none of that was done it was just the samurai well, according to according to Wikipedia, the girlfriend was th- the reincarnated spirit of the samurai who brought it into the house. But also the Wikipedia plot synopsis says that um, during the attacks, she levitates in the air. Bullshit. She's jilling. <laughs> she's not. She's jilling off. She's not uh, levitating in midair. She's no. preparing a yummy, yummy taco as a midnight snack for the Wisconsin samurai. Yes. Uh, who names their dog Chuki? I'm pretty sure that's the last name of the guy who invented Gumby. Yeah, probably. Art. Art Chuki. I love this movie so much. It is so bizarre. And also, to be clear, let's do some let's do some stats. 1982 supernatural, nonlinear, orgasmic slasher. I guess it's an international co-production. Get this between Paris, France, and rural Wisconsin. Yeah. Which is ironic because I am currently working on a film 
It's an international co-production between London, England and Tucson, Arizona. It's called A Spot of Tea and Chimichangas. And it's about a British lord named Sir Thomas Frederick Theodore Wifflebottom III. And he visits Tucson. And then a bunch of just a bunch of cholos just beat the shit out of him. Yeah. It's three hours. It's three hours and nine minutes long, just like Babylon. And uh, the majority of the film is an uncomfortable close up of the beat down. It's kind of like the rape scene in Irreversible. Okay. Gaspar Noe. He is a uh, he is a filmmaker that I recommend all of my enemies go and watch. <laughs> hey, people who hate me. Hey, people who hate trans people. You know what you should do? Go see Irreversible. Great movie. Laugh Riot. You'll love it. After that, there's this drama that won a bunch of Oscars. It's called a Serbian film. You should see yeah. that, too. It's a fun one. It's a fun one. Have you rolling in the aisles? Uh, Bloodbeat was written, produced, and directed by a guy named Fabrice Anji Zafiratos. Holy crap, was that a spell? Did I just summon a demon? Quick, honey, get me some salt! <laughs> Shit! I think I summoned the demon that killed Mary Winchester! And yeah! He was on drugs when he made this movie. <laughs> In fact, apparently the title Bloodbeat is allegedly a reference to the accelerated heartbeat that you get while you're tripping balls in rural Wisconsin. It makes sense. Like you see this bizarre, obscure 80s horror slasher film and you go, wait, did an orgasm just summon the vengeful spirit of a dead samurai to a random house in the middle of Wisconsin? Is there a ghost that throws cans of tab at people? What the hell is going on? And then you learn, oh, the director was a French druggie who decided to make a horror film under the influence in rural Wisconsin. And you go, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. Okay, then. Yeah. I'm seeing this film in a bit of a clearer light now. <laughs> Um, here's another way you can tell that the writer, director, producer of this was on drugs when he made the film. Uh, the director of photography, whose name I won't say because I'll probably summon another demon, he mistakenly thought that he was filming a made-for-TV movie, so they filmed Bloodbeat in full screen for over two weeks before the director realized the F-up and that's why this film isn't in widescreen. Okay. This film was meant to be seen in theaters, but they fucked up. Because they were high. I love that. I th The reason why I think that, that, that uh, Bloodbeat is Troll 2's cousin is because, you know, here is a... French person under the influence making a film in the middle of nowhere America about what it's like to be in Wisconsin and it's like like okay the acting in Troll 2 isn't the same as the acting in Bloodbeat and the script for Troll 2 isn't the same as the script in Bloodbeat but there's a there's a there's a vibe yes there's just a vibe and it's difficult to explain but but you know, this this is some random demon summoning druggy Frenchman's understanding of what life in America is like. And this movie is a trip, and I think more people should watch this. I love it. It's bad. Don't get me wrong. Yes. This movie sucks. But it's free on YouTube, for Pete's sake. You know? But everybody gets psychic powers in this. Yeah, everybody. And everybody, everybody glows. Everybody glows. Everybody glows, Georgie. Everybody glows down here. What was it? It was my brother, my brother and me who did this long bit about it. And it's like, uh, you know, Pennywise is like attacking people in like the 1950s and 1960s because like you couldn't get kids today. 
Yeah. Hey, Georgie, come on down to the sewer. I've got a paper boat. Really? I've got a fucking iPhone. Yeah. Everybody, come over here. Let's beat the shit out of this sewer clown. Like, you couldn't do that now. But he- here's something weird, Bunny. Uh, yeah. uh, going way off script. Uh, Eleanor believes that Pennywise is real. Okay. Eleanor, uh, my littlest, she's six. She believes that Pennywise is real, number one. Number two, that there's a bunch of Pennywises, that they are different colors depending on their their uh, what type they are. Yeah. Oh, this one's a friendly one. That's why it's a blue Pennywise. Oh, this one's red. You got to watch out. Oh, no. This is this. And, and here's the thing. They all live in different sewers. Uh-huh. So we'll just be going for a walk around the block, and it's like, oh, that one's a yellow Pennywise, and he lives there. And so it's so weird, but um, also um, she's been leaving food and drinks for Pennywise. Okay. So she's like, other mother, can I have some <coughs> grapes? Sure, you want to eat some grapes? No, I want to put them in the sewer for Pennywise, and it's like, Okay, sure. Yeah, okay. I'm going to get you some grapes so we can go outside and put them in the sewer so Pennywise can eat them. That makes perfect sense. Do you have any Do you have any sodas that... Okay, I have this peach water drink that Amber gave me that I have no intention of ever drinking. I bet Pennywise is going to love it. Let's pour it down the sewer for Pennywise to drink. Dodge that bullet. And, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, it... it I'm learning so much about the Pennywises because we have a we have a sewer grate right in front of our house. So we've got a Pennywise just right there in front of our house. It's kind of nice having a Pennywise there. Sometimes Eleanor will talk into the sewer. Pennywise is just her friend. Okay. To be fair, I just want to be clear that this isn't. I am not to blame for any of this. This is all Mal. Oh, okay. This is not me. This is all Mal's doing. How can we pin it on him? Uh, Because he's the one who's just... He was obsessed with it for a while. Remember when when Mal was obsessed with it? Because Mal gets very intensely hyper-focused on things for a while. For a good while. It was uh, the movie The Batman. And that was surprising. That was really surprising. And then and Christian then they transitioned. No, no, the Batman, the Rob Bat Battinson one. Oh. That one. Like they were obsessed with that movie for a while. And so that was surprising. And then uh they transitioned that into the show Gotham. Gotham. Like Gotham was on TV 24-7 in this house. Really? For like a couple of months. And and uh Mal got really obsessed with uh, the Penguin, and it's like, please watch Batman Return with me. <laughs> please, because your like your version of your version of the Riddler is uh, it, Paul Dano, and your version of the Penguin is a skinny, effeminate gay guy. Please, let's watch Devito together. Yeah. Oh, but first he has to fight the clown gang. And and then after that, we're watching Jim Carrey knock it out of the park. (laughs) But they won't watch those ones. So we haven't gotten there yet. Or or the absolute classic Batman and Robin. Best Mr. Freeze ever. (laughs) <laughs> the only Mr. Freeze ever. <laughs> oh, come on. There was Otto Preminger. Yeah, there was Otto Preminger. Sure. Uh, this has been a great episode of the podcast. Eleanor. Eleanor. Do you want to talk to Bonnie about Pennywise's? I was talking about you and Pennywise's. Can, can you tell us what colors mean? Come here. Can you? If you want to. You don't have to. Don't touch. 
Can you? Come here. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I know there's different colors of Pennywise's. And we were talking about you're a fan, you're a fan of Pennywise, yeah? Okay, so there are different colored Pennywises. What do what do the colors mean? The colors mean what they want to eat? Oh, okay. So like a blue Pennywise. What would a blue Pennywise want to eat? Uh, hold on. Freaking. Okay, there you go. Ten minute so, warning. Okay. So so a, a blue Pennywise would want to eat blueberries and blackberries? Okay, what would a red Pennywise want to eat? Strawberries. Strawberries, yes. Okay, what about a what about a chartreuse? What about a chartreuse pennywise? What about a green pennywise, but not not forest green, not hunter green, Kelly green? vegetables okay nice 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 good job okay so we've learned a lot about pennywise and we've learned a lot about what french people think uh wisconsin is yes what what'd you say you whispered pennywise directly into the microphone okay cool uh poor eleanor was born with a disease that you may have heard about in uh woody allen films where uh sadly she was born unfocused. Yes. We're very sad about it. We've taken her to a lot of specialists, but she was born unfocused. And, uh, you know, sometimes she'll have her moments where yeah. she'll come into focus. But most of the time, uh, now Maxwell, <laughs> Maxwell is, is better at being focused, but Eleanor is just... Oh ah! <laughs> Yeah, it focused on you for a second there, Eleanor. Oh, oh, there you are. Nope. Ah, yes. <laughs> We're having fun with the. Uh, this is this is a. Uh, the edible has kicked in. Hi, Mal. Okay, so that's it for. Oh, oh, it's not you. It's not Mal. It's it's you. Okay, I I I can't see because. Okay, so. Stop speaking directly into the microphone. You're gonna you're gonna deaf people. You're gonna deafen people. Yeah. What? If you want to, yeah. Go for it. Oh, okay. I don't think Bunny heard you. I don't think Bunny heard you. I don't no. think Bunny heard you. That's okay. Uh all right. This has been a very strange episode of uh, the Pope on Film podcast. You can tell when the edibles kicked in for sure. Uh, uh, the Batman is a good movie. Fuck you. Yes. Fuck you. Aha. Uh -huh. Is this is this you? Yes. Oh. Oh. Uh Okay, I oh this has been Mal uh, spamming us this whole time. I, I kind of thought so. Okay, I I hadn't been reading it at all at I all. Swear. Yeah. Okay. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the people on SoundCloud are gonna love this episode. Uh, so that is it for Bloodbeat this week. It's a bizarre movie. It's on YouTube. You should watch it. It's weird AF. Um, next week, we're going to go to a more uh, well-known film, even though it's still a strange one. We are going to be watching one of my favorite films of 2022, the low-budget A24 British comedy, Brian and Charles. Okay. It is waiting for you on the Cough Cough Bunny. It is an adorable film about this stupid inventor who makes a robot. That's the entirety of the movie. But it's done in a really cute way that I can't fully explain in a way that gives it justice. But it's a great movie and it's fun. 
guys, can you not fight while I'm trying to do the podcast? Okay, Eleanor hit her head on the chair. So y'all need to stop. Okay, it's all fun and games until someone pokes their eye out. Okay, stop it, Chewy. So uh, next week, we are going to be doing Brian and Charles. We're also going to be discussing the true story of America's first mockumentary and the trouble it got into with the U.S. government. Uh, but now that I'm looking back, that's next week. Now that I'm looking back at this week, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, uh, Dead Samurai and um, Letterboxd and King Kong and Grimace and Tostitos. Go get yourself some Tostitos, people. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast. <laughs> this has been a damn good episode of the podcast. So until next week. Oh, that's you. You say that, bar. <laughs> the edibles have kicked in fully at this point. Oh, Eleanor, stop. stop. Eleanor, stop. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend May Lynn. And on behalf of Mal and Natasha and Max and Eleanor, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you douche waffles and poopy tits. And you ninjas. What did you say? Did you say Pennywise again? You did? Okay, there you go. Do 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 do